Our gospel comes from Mark chapter 7. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands. Well, we know that's not true because the disciples are Jewish and they just did it. Thus, observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside of a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within the human heart that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder. Can you go back one more? Adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from God, our creator, Jesus, our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. Amen. So we start with the religious leaders asking why this morning. They are upset about the disciples not washing their hands and eating with defiled hands, and they've got something to say about it. Uh, but as we heard in the children's message, they don't exactly say it in the nicest way. They're not approaching uh, from a lens of curiosity. Instead, they're very much approaching from a lens of accusation, right? Jesus, why don't your disciples care about the traditions of the elders? Why are they so careless, and why do they eat with defiled hands? Not the best tone, right? And it's interesting because it says all the Jewish people do this, but the disciples are Jewish, you know. So is Jesus. And also, this command is nowhere in the Hebrew Bible. It's nowhere in the Old Testament to wash your hands before eating a meal. Although I think we can all agree it's a pretty good idea. But again, the question that they ask from a place of accusation is not the way of, to go about talking about these rules and traditions and to help the disciples understand the why. And Jesus takes issue with this and he calls them out on their hypocrisy here. He calls them out on their hypocrisy. He quotes Isaiah, and he says that you're basically giving lip service to the tradition. You're giving lip service to the law and prioritizing it over the commands of God. It's really interesting because the Greek word for hypocrisy literally means acting with a mask. Acting with a mask. And that's what these religious leaders are doing. They're so focused on their piety that they're letting it separate them from their neighbor. They're so focused on being right that they're letting it affect their relationships. And we know that the commands of God, that they're prioritizing over the tradition, God's greatest command is to love God and to love neighbor, right? That's what it all comes down to. Traditions are great. They get passed down from generation to generation. They have a lot of meaning for people. There's a lot of really fun family traditions and traditions in our church that have great meaning. But when the meaning isn't there anymore, the tradition becomes piety. It becomes kind of futile. It loses its essence when it's just, well, this is the way we've always done things. That's where the issue arises. But if we can, if we can articulate the why this is important to us, then traditions can be so beautiful and can hold ground for many, many generations Think about your Christmas family traditions. And when you explain to your kids and your grandkids, what, this is why we do this, the tradition has so much more meaning. There's a story uh, kind of about that, about traditions, that I heard about a young girl who was cooking a turkey for the first time with her mom. And the mom was cutting the legs off before the turkey went into the oven. 
She said, Mom, why don't we take the legs off of the turkey? And she said, well, that's the way that my mom always did it. And so the girl goes to her grandmother, and she says, hey, Grandma, why do you cut the, tur the legs off the turkey before you cook it? And the grandma says, well, that's the way that my mom always did it. And this little girl was lucky enough that her great-grandmother was still living, and so she went to her great-grandmother, and she asked the same question. Hey, great-grandma, why do we always cut the legs off of the turkey before we cook it? And the great-grandma says, well, our pan wasn't big enough. <laughs> So this is a perfect example of traditions being passed down and passed down and passed down, but the why doesn't apply anymore because surely they have a big enough pan now. It has lost the meaning of the tradition. I've also been thinking about traditions of the language that we use here at CTK. Um, I just did it, an acronym, Christ the King Lutheran Church, right? We are in a year of celebrating tradition. It's our 60th anniversary year. But last week, I was noticing at our ministry fair, we use a lot of insider language around these parts. We say CTK, which to us means Christ the King Lutheran Church, but to somebody else, it's just a string of letters and means absolutely nothing. Um, we talk about our ministry boards using acronyms like VSD for Vision Strategy and Development or RMB for Resource Ministry Board or FFMB for Faith Formation Ministry Board or CLIM for Congregational Life Ministry Board. You get the point. We use all these acronyms, and it's great in that they're efficient, and inside we know what each other mean, but if we're trying to be welcoming and not exclusive, these, this insider language falls a little flat. And same with uh, in the traditional space, there's a beautiful liturgy, probably my favorite piece of the liturgy, called the Kyrie. And these Latin words, Kyrie eleison, we sing. And it means, Lord, have mercy. But again, if you don't know the why behind that tradition, it doesn't mean very much to you. And so it's important that we consider our insider language, especially as we're entering into a new program year. Rally day is next Sunday. We may have some visitors, and we want to welcome people. Because tradition at its worst can exclude and make people feel like they don't belong, and it misses the mark in that, in that regard. But tradition at its best honors a legacy, and it lifts up, and it explains, and it, you, it connects us at its best. And this is the issue in our gospel lesson today, is that the religious leaders, they miss the mark, and their traditions are used to exclude instead of to include and connect and to honor the law, which is what they're trying to do. These Pharisees and scribes, they were such dedicated people. They really cared deeply, and yet they let their piety separate rather than connect. But Jesus' main issue isn't with the Pharisees or the scribes or the law in this gospel lesson. His main issue is with the human heart. And he says this quite point blankly in this gospel. He says, Evil intentions come from the heart. Ouch. <laughs> that stings a little. Evil intentions come from within us, from our hearts. This is hard to hear, especially when it's so much easier to think of evil as a little red guy with horns and a pitchfork and out there somewhere else. But yes, we are capable of evil. We are capable of harming one another. We are capable of intentionally creating divides and thinking that we're better than other people. We are capable of things like white supremacy and destroying the earth. We are capable of that. And we are also capable of so much good and love and joy and hope. Jesus doesn't say that the heart only contains evil. He's coming from a context where the ancients thought that the heart was the seat of all rationality and will. It's really interesting to think about because we usually think of the head as the seat of all rationality and will. So this is kind of a reframe for us of thinking of it coming from our heart. And so this week when I've been thinking about this, I've been thinking about doing that heart work, the heart work of deconstructing, the heart work of digging deep into where are evil intentions coming out of me? Where am I not as in control of my purpose, of my why, of my intentions? Where am I letting other things get the best of me? Where have I gone astray? Where am I thinking I'm better than other people? This is that heart work. And it is hard work, let me tell you. Heart work. It's much easier to intellectualize and think it all comes from our head, right? Much easier that way. And when I was thinking about this heart work, I was thinking about how sometimes I go to yoga classes, and whenever I go, 
I just want to not think at all. And I just want to exercise and be in the moment and not have to think at all. But one of the first things that if you've ever been to a yoga class, the yoga teacher will ask you, okay, take a moment and set your intention. I'm just thinking, are you kidding me? I don't want to do that. I just want to do the, the different poses and go on with my day. But you're asking me to do that heart work right here, right now on a Saturday morning? Are you kidding me? Set your intention. It's a hard thing to do, to think about our why, our purpose, when we're so used to just getting to the what and the how and checking off our to-do list and thinking of the logistics of things and on to the next thing taking a moment to set our intentions. And in yoga, your intention can be anything from being present in that moment to having positive thoughts about your body instead of negative ones or um, letting your breath anchor you through that hour or feeling harmony between your mind, body, and spirit. It can be any of those things. But the point is that you take a moment to actually think about why you're there as opposed to just showing up and going through the motions, which is what I want to do. Well, James... Our reading from James gives us a little bit of insight into how to do some of this heart work, how to set our intentions, how to get to the root of our purpose. James says, my beloved, let everyone be quick to listen and slow to speak. I think these words are so important because how often do we just say whatever without thinking about the why behind it? Listening to hear as opposed to listening to respond. You've heard that one before, I'm sure and listening to our neighbor, doing that heart work with what we hear, and then speaking from our hearts instead of from our heads, responding in that way. I think this is a beautiful invitation. But James doesn't just say only listen. He goes on to then say, be doers of the word. If you just hear things and don't ever act, you've missed the point altogether also. Listen, process, do the heart work, and respond from a place of love and grace respond, doers of the word. My invitation for you this week is that you dig deep into knowing your why, that as annoying as it may be, you set your intention. Think about what you want to do this week, who you are, what your purpose is, why you're even here, why you keep coming back to this place, what your next steps are, what type of heart work you need to do at this time. Know your why. Set your intention. It can be scary sometimes. It can be scary in our gospel lesson when Jesus says that evil intentions come from our heart. But we know that good comes from there too. And we are the only ones who can be in control of that. I find great comfort in the chorus of our closing hymn that you'll hear later this morning. It says, don't fear no evil. Not the evil within yourself either. You don't have to be afraid of it. You can face it. Don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you, all of you. All of your heart. The good and the bad. Take courage. Hold on. Be strong. Remember where your help comes from. You don't have to do it alone. God walks with you every step of the way. God softens our hearts. God has written a new covenant in our hearts of love. And this is the good news for you today. Amen.